Hello and welcome to Scope Stadium for the third annual Bouncy Ball Championships. Joining me for some high-flying action today is league legend Barry Bunsen. Uh, yes I am. Insightful as always, Barry. Uh, oh, it looks like they're about to start the high bounce event. Uh, we better put on our best hushed commentator voices as we cross down to the action. First into the bounce arena is Dr. Rob. He'll be looking to improve upon last year's disappointing fifth place. Uh, now I gather his ball is made from the newly developed ultra resilient high fly. Now to newcomers, it's a rubber formula straight out of the labs at the AIS. Oh, I think the referee's giving him the countdown. He's using high fly? That's brave. Isn't that the stuff that went out of control at the Mexico meet? That certainly is, but it's a high risk, high reward strategy. Oh, here we go. Oh no, I think he's misbounced. Oh, that could go anywhere. It could get us. Barry, we're not safe. Take cover. I think it stopped, Barry. <laughs> Ooh. You all right, mate? Mm. Oh, I see. Mm. Uh, we'll be right back uh, after these messages. show. I've just been collecting a few bits and pieces for today and you know what, by comparing the things in here you can actually work out what today is all about. Let's see, we've got, uh, well there's things that bounce in here, but it's not just about bounce. There's, uh, oh well, there's things that stretch in here, but it's not just about stretch. Uh, there's a balloon and a basketball. Okay, right now there's probably a bunch of you out there screaming at your TVs, it's about rubber! And it is about rubber. So let's uh, open it up and see what's on the inside. Today on Scope, things get all gummy at a gumboot factory. We find out how latex can change the way you look and we get to grips with some tyre shredding technology. So question number one is, what is it? I suppose that's the first question you think of with any material. Uh, but in the case of rubber, that one question can have a few different answers. Bizarre, I know. Uh, so let's start with natural rubber. It starts off as latex, a milky coloured sap traditionally collected from trees such as the rubber tree, although many other plants also produce latex. So the liquid latex that I've got here is not straight from a tree, but this is actually from an art store. It's been stabilised with ammonia to stop it coagulating. But what we can do is counteract that with an acid, in this case some vinegar, and then what we'll get is some natural latex rubber. Chemically speaking, natural rubber is a polymer. This means its molecules are long chains of the same groups of atoms joined together over and over. In natural rubber, the repeating unit is called isoprene. So technically, what I just made is polyisoprene. And there we have our bouncy ball made from natural latex rubber. Now, rubber bands, uh, rubber gloves, and even balloons, they're all made from latex rubber as well. It's great stuff, except that over time, it perishes. That means it loses its elasticity, just like an old rubber band. But never fear, we can vulcanise it. Basically, the rubber is heated with some sulphur, or other additives, and on an atomic scale, this causes the long molecular chains to cross-link or mesh together. Car tyres, shoe soles, even hockey pucks are all examples that use the more durable and resilient vulcanised rubber. But what about this? Now, it shares many of the properties of natural rubber with its rubbery elasticity-ness, but it actually contains no natural rubber whatsoever. What it's made from is one of a number of compounds collectively known as synthetic rubber. And it is everywhere. There's the neoprene used to make wetsuits. These inflatable rubber boats are actually synthetic rubber boats. The chew in chewing gum is, you guessed it, a synthetic rubber. Not to mention a whole array of silicon rubbers used in everything from medical applications to aerospace, largely because of their stability under a range of conditions. One condition that will determine a rubber's usefulness is its temperature, and we're going to start with the cold. Now this bouncy rubber ball here is going to be cooled down in some dry ice, that's about minus 77, and that should get it below its glass transition temperature. 
and we'll see what happens. This means those long polymer molecules in there that used to give the spring and flex to the rubber are now locked up. Well, time to check out the results. Ah, ah but first let's remind ourselves, bouncy rubber ball, very cold. Uh, yeah, not so much. More like a marble, really. The rubber actually becomes very, very brittle when it gets down below that temperature. <clears throat> this is why there are different tyres for really cold weather and why racing car drivers have to warm up their tyres to get the best grip. Speaking of temperature, did you know that rubber actually emits heat when it's stretched? You see, all of the energy stored in those coiled up bonds is given off thermally when you stretch them out and then it actually gets sucked back in when it contracts. You can feel it on your lips, it goes, oh, warm, cold, warm, cold. Actually, I'm sure there's much more exciting rubber band experiments than that one. Rubber bands may seem boring, but in just a few steps there can be loads of fun. Today we're going to figure out how to make the bounciest rubber band ball. For this experiment, we'll be using two different types of rubber bands, foam balls, which you can get at the craft store, and ping pong balls. And we'll need a measuring tape, sticky putty, coloured markers, a pen and paper, and a space to do our bouncing. Start by making a rubber band ball with the smaller rubber bands. Take a small handful of rubber bands and tighten another rubber band around them. Keep doing this, trying to make the shape as round as possible. Don't pull the rubber bands too tight, just enough so that they stay in place. This ball will take 250 small rubber bands to make. Do the same thing with the larger rubber bands, but it should only take about 50. The balls will both be about 5 centimetres across. Next we'll make another two, except with ping pong balls in the middle. Just wrap the rubber bands around the ball in the same way, using 100 small rubber bands and 25 large rubber bands. When you're done, label them with one of your markers. Then, do the same with the foam balls, marking them with your other coloured marker. We've ended up with six. One with large rubber bands, one with small rubber bands. Small rubber bands around a ping pong ball. Large rubber bands around a ping pong ball. Small rubber bands around a foam ball. Large rubber bands around a foam ball. Now it's time to test which ones are the bounciest. Stick the measuring tape against the wall and drop the first ball from the top. Keep a close eye on it so that you can tell how high it bounced and make a note of this measurement. Repeat the process a few times so that you can double check your results. Then do the same for all the other balls we've made. surprised by our results. The size of the rubber bands didn't make much difference and the bounciest balls were the pure rubber ones. We actually thought the ones with the ping pong ball in the centre would work the best because this creates an air pocket in the middle of the ball just like the larger balls we use for sports. But they were actually the least bouncy. We think this might be because these balls, without a foam or ping pong core, were squishy and elastic all of the way through. The outside of a ping pong ball also isn't very flexible, so this might be why these balls didn't bounce very well. There are still lots of factors we can experiment with. Like the size of the ball. Or how much we stretch the rubber bands. So it seems rubber bands are pretty interesting after all. Coming up on Scope. They say a good actor should have a rubbery face. But literally? Well, stay tuned to find out more. Ah, hello and welcome back to Scope. Now today's show is all about, well it's actually not all about balloons, but it is all about the stuff from which balloons are made. It's, it's rubber. Oh, and on a side note, did you know it was the famous scientist Michael Faraday who actually invented balloons? Apparently he needed some for some hydrogen experiments. Oh, 
Okay, maybe not quite like that, but did you also know that originally balloons were made from leather or even pig's bladders? Ah, imagine. Oh, anyway, sorry, uh, on to rubber footwear. They're worn for fun or for work, and they've been protecting feet from water, mud, and much worse muck for ages. They're gum boots, otherwise known as Wellington boots or rubber boots, and I'm gonna show you how they're made. Hi, I'm Michael from Blunston, and the process for making gum boots starts over here. Today we're making white boots, and we begin with 800 kilogram bags of white pellets, which are our raw gum boot making material. These are composed of PVC plastic combined with a small amount of synthetic rubber, and they give the finished boots great properties. The plastic in the pellets makes the boots waterproof and durable, while the rubber makes them wear resistant and comfy to wear. Now the pellets get sucked out of this box by a vacuum system and deposited into this hopper. From the hopper, the pellets are loaded onto the screw, which they travel along as they are heated up. We heat the pellets to around 160 degrees Celsius, which causes them to melt. The hot PVC goo is then forced by the machine into the moulds for the legs of the boots, and we push in one pair at a time. But before the leg moulds get filled with PVC, a couple of important things happen. A fabric sock is loaded onto each leg mould, and the steel cap is placed on the toe. The socks allow feet to slip in and out of our boots easily, and the steel caps can protect toes from being crushed. After we've moulded the legs of the boots, it's time to give them some soles. The leg moulds open and rotate, so they're lined up with the sole moulds, which are then filled with hot PVC. The pellets we melt down to make our soles contain more rubber than the leg pellets. That's because their job is to produce durable, abrasion-resistant and slip-resistant soles, which needn't feel comfy against our skin. Next, we take our fully formed boots out of the moulds and then we transfer them to our trimming machine. We use this machine to slice off any excess PVC or fabric sock from the top of the boot and then they're ready to be labelled. And this is our finished product, or just one of our finished products. These boots are ready to ship out. Welcome to another Scope in a Flash, I'm Ted Petrie and turn up the volume, it's great to be with me. Well, earthquakes, these ground shakers can cause lots of damage and destruction. But recently a team of researchers from the University of Manchester have found a way to use rubber to make buildings invisible to earthquakes. You see, the seismic waves that earthquakes cause can travel freely through dense rock. But it appears that when they run into an airfield pressurised substance, they are deflected and change directions. So the idea is for pressurised rubber to be placed around a building as a cloaking device to make the building invisible to the waves, which would be diverted around the structure. This research could help save lives in future earthquakes. I'm Ted Petrie, and invisibility isn't my style. Movies would be pretty boring without special effects makeup to help bring fantastic characters to life. And it's usually thanks to some special types of rubber. Hi, my name's Corey and it's my job to make some amazing transformations using latex and silicon rubber. Let me show you how. We can use rubber to give someone exaggerated human features or create completely different features in whatever shape we can imagine. We use rubber because it's light, stretchy and three-dimensional. Today I'm going to show you the process of going from a bare face through to a complete character makeup. First thing we need to do is start with a life cast. After applying some moisturiser, I gently press on a gum-like substance called alginate. And on top of this, some plaster bandage to help stiffen it up. After we've pulled it off of the face, we pour in some plaster. It takes about 30 minutes to set, and then with a little bit of cleaning up, and an additional layer of protective coating, we're left with a perfect replica of the shape of their face. 
Now it's time to design our latex prosthetic in clay. What we make here will be exactly what the latex ends up looking like. So we go to extreme detail, right down to the fine lines, wrinkles and pores. Then once we've finished our sculpt, we make a mould right over the top. I'll mix together some latex with a few other chemicals until I've got a light, fluffy consistency. Then I pour it into the space between the two moulds and then bake it so that it feels much like a sponge cake. Now comes the fun part, attaching this foam latex piece to her face. So now it's time to paint the piece so it blends straight into the face. I use lots of different tools like brushes and sponges and lots of different coloured makeups to make the feature look realistic. Our aim is to blend the feature so well that you can't tell where it ends and the skin begins. Next we'll move on to silicon rubber. These are fantastic because they've got a see-through quality and so they appear a little bit more like skin. Silicon rubber can be used for the same features as latex and is very similar to some of the products you'll find around the house. We can also use it to make small pieces that can be applied straight out of the mould and onto the skin. And the technique is exactly the same. I'm going to clean the skin, glue on the piece and blend it in with makeup. All up, the whole process can take at least 12 hours. And once applied, this type of makeup can last for more than 10 hours. Just how grippy is grippy? And what makes a slippery surface slippery? Never fear, science has the answer to all these odd questions. And they're coming right up. Hello and welcome back to Scope, an episode that's all about rubber, just like this rubber here, or eraser. Actually, this gives us a clue as to where rubber got its name. You see, when natural latex rubber was first brought back to England, someone discovered that it was really good at rubbing pencil marks off paper, and the name rubber was born. I wonder what else you can do with this stuff. Rock climbers count on their rubber shoes to climb well, and they really put rubber's grippiness to the test. And in quite a different way, I do too. Hi, I'm Peter from CSIRO. My team and I test the slip resistance of rubber and other materials, and I'm just about to show you how it's done. We work with tiles of common flooring materials, including rubber, and we test them to see how grippy or slip resistant they are. Rubber is found in the floors of many buildings, sports venues and playgrounds, and the companies who build them ask us to check if the floor surfaces will be grippy enough so they won't be the cause of slips and falls. So how do we test the slip resistance of materials like this? Well, we use an inclined ramp machine. We stick a tile of the flooring surface we're testing onto the machine's backing pad and we coat it with a special type of oil. This stuff represents all the dust, dirt and spills that typically contaminate floor surfaces and it increases the slipperiness of the tile. Then, just like a rock climber preparing for a climb, our tester puts a safety harness on. The harness that Andy is wearing will catch him from falling off the ramp, which he will do at the end of this test. A test involves walking up and then down the ramp raising the angle of the ramp by a few degrees and walking up and down it once again. Our test boots have soles made of a specific type of rubber which have a particular type of tread and boots like these are worn in slip resistance tests around the world. 
Also, the steps that testers take while walking up and down a ramp are always 15 centimetres long. Now, our tester continues the process of walking up and down the machine and increasing its angle until he can't stay on it anymore. Good luck, Andy. That's when the harness comes in handy. We'll record how steep the ramp was when the slip occurred, which gives us a slip resistance rating for the tile we tested. This rating is then compared to set standards for these things, and we let the customer who sent the tile in know if it's grippy enough for their floors. Now, because some floors aren't meant to be walked on in shoes, we also conduct tests in bare feet. In these tests, the tile is kept wet because the floors that these tiles are made for are often wet. Our barefoot tests run just like the other ones and they all end up with our tester falling off the ramp. So, how does rubber rate on the scale of floor surface grippiness? So this smooth rubber achieved an R9 rating, whilst this textured rubber achieved an R10 rating. In comparison, a footpath would achieve an R11 rating. But if ground up and combined with ingredients like cork or moulded into tiles with even more texture than this one, rubber can make some of the grippiest floors you'll ever come across. Rubber tyres have always been built tough to last. And for car passengers, that's a good thing. But for the environment, it's not, as each year millions of old tyres add to the world's pollution problems. Of course, tyres can become rubbish if they're recycled, and tyre recycling is what we do here. Hi, I'm Steve from Tyre Crumb, and I'm going to show you the process. It all starts with our trucks collecting scrap tyres from garages and tyre dealers, and bringing them back to our processing plant. On arrival, the trucks are weighed on a weigh bridge, unloaded and then weighed again so we can work out the exact weight of each load. Then the tyres are sorted into car tyres.